Today, my guest is CEO of Beachwood PR, Paul Hayes. Paul is one of Europe's leading technology strategists. He hosts and leads a range of sector shaping initiatives from startup wakes to flounders in Europe and the US. As the internal communications lead at companies like Havoc and Demonware, he shaped exciting new communication strategies for a whole sector of games, middleware early in his career. He has worked with indigenous companies like Intercom to grow their global profile in a completely new sector from startup to scale up. Internationally, he also works with the founders and CEOs of global technology companies to enhance their public profiles across EMEA and beyond. In 2011, he founded Beach Hut PR and still today is the CEO of it. I'm delighted to welcome you to the show. Thanks for having me, James. Quick question. To, the first question to start with, you might share an overview of your career to date, highs and lows, what you've learned and what are you most proud of? Whoa. That's a that's a very existential question for a Monday. I uh, I suppose I, I'm an accidental PR person. I grew up in a pub in Tipperary, uh, and that's kind of where I did uh, most of my learning about human nature. And then I um, I did a degree in Greek and Roman with Ryan Tuberty. I think he has my job, and I've got his in reality. Uh, and I ended up as a political press secretary. There was uh, the, we got kicked out of government uh, back then. So I ended up, my, my first job in PR was uh, helping to run a thing called the Cider Industry Council, which was set up by Noel Gilmore. And it was to rehabilitate the image of cider. Can you believe it had a bad reputation before we were all paying seven quid for a bottle of Bulmers? <laughs> uh, and it was an amazing job because it was really about changing perception on a complete industry sector. It became too successful because it used to be taxed at the arts and crafts level. And then when it got to be went from like 5% to 12% of the beer market. Uh, I think it got whacked with the full tax after that, but it was an amazing turnaround in terms of a new category of thing. Uh, and then I went into various other uh, technology related kind of uh, PR activities. And it was two lads out of Trinity that changed my trajectory completely. And they were starting a company called Telekinesis Research, uh, which was about deploying physics engines in games, God help me. And I was doing Xerox and Microsoft for a great company called Text 100 at the time. And they said, when you come to California, and I'd never been to California. So I said, absolutely, I'll go. And we ended up in San Jose at the Game Developers Conference. Why they write songs about San Jose, I'll never know. It's not quite as described in the song. But uh, I remember in a dive bar in San Jose, actually probably at a urinal, they offered me a job. And I said, absolutely. I liked California. And if you need me out here to do some stuff, then that's okay by me. And uh I never looked back. And so I worked there. Telekinesis research became Havoc. And then um, that was great. There was an exit to Intel. And uh, then I met two young fellas, uh, sorry, Collins and Sean Blanchfield had started another games company, Demonware, which was all about people playing online for the first time. This shows how old I am. You know, the Havoc days was PlayStation 1. We're on PlayStation 5 now. Um, so, uh, and then in 2003, I decided that uh, before I got married, we would have our gap year. We were the oldest swingers in town. Sorry, that doesn't sound right. But we, we took our gap year and went around the world. And I worked for a lot of these companies. And so I called my company Beach Hut because we did it from Beach Huts. And I had my best year ever. And I assumed that this was how my life would continue forever. I forgot about kids that we've just been interrupted by and everything else. But uh, Beach Hut came from being able to work. Yeah, I was remote working before anyone was thinking about remote working. And that was nearly 20 years ago, 2003. And uh, now we've built the company into a broad-based technology PR company. We're doing PR for every sector and thing you could think of under the sun, from drones and e-scooters and urban mobility to healthcare to uh, delivery to you know hard data to fintech, N26, and all these new challenger banks. And we're doing it from Dublin, but we're doing it in... Berlin and New York and London and San Francisco. And uh, I suppose the move online for us with the pandemic wasn't that big a jump, really. We did have an office that we all went to, but we realized we were working in a distributed way anyway before the pandemic. And our clients were all over the planet, and so were we, So uh, or the, the, the journalists that we were dealing with. And so I guess I've accidentally, over the last 20 years, uh, built an international PR practice in technology. 
Wow, that's a really interesting. And I, I love your little sabbatical for the year, which everybody wants to do that. Well, we can, we, it'd be more difficult to do it now because obviously of the restraints. But what a, yeah, we just, we just had one. It's just been awful. <laughs> <laughs> but tell, me, tell me about the good one, actually. What did you do? I mean, when you, how were you when you jumped onto the sabbatical? And then what was, the kind of, what was your thinking? And just roll with it. And it was to roll with this. And there's, a, there's obviously a time-honored uh, route that you go, uh, all your aviation clients will know the round the world ticket that you can have seven or eight stops and you do a little bit of Asia. And then when you get sick of drinking, uh, you know, cocktails out of buckets in Koh Samui, you eventually move on to Australia and you do something there. And then you get to New Zealand and Fiji and back to the States. You can be a bit more adventurous if you go India and everywhere else. So we were, ju- we were just trying everything as we went, but I timed it to coincide with a number of, different conferences that were on in different sectors. And so they had on the ground people at those conferences in, in Sydney, in Tokyo, um, and uh, in LA. And uh, it just became a great year. Wow. But I think everybody listening to this was like, I wish we could do that now, or I wish we did it now. Maybe it's, yeah. don't put off stuff, just do it. Maybe that's the post pandemic. Well, my, my Australian bit, because everyone does that kind of fat bit in the middle for three or four months in Australia, I think, you know, when they're doing their gap year. And it turned into an amazing thing where um, an old buddy of mine from college, uh, Paddy Dominguez of the Drumcondra Dominguez, um, he was a, a sports agent down there and he was representing all the All Blacks and all the, uh, um, uh, you know, the Wallabies and Leighton Hewitt and Mark Philippoussis and he was working this big company. But he basically discovered Michael Phelps in a pool in, in, in uh, Melbourne in 2003. And this was just the year before uh, the Athens Olympics. And so uh, I started working with Paddy and my job was to uh, mind Michael Phelps. So we played a lot of computer games. I mean, he was only a 15-year-old kid at the time. Um, so, uh, yeah, and it ended up bringing me in all sorts of different directions. But it was uh, just say yes to things. I think taking time off, uh, there's a great quote from uh, he, he, uh, Lawrence Crowley, who died recently, uh, that, uh, a great man of Irish tech, but he always said, you know, have gap years, have, have time off. And, you know, when you have time off, you A, get to think deeply about things, but also you're, people know you're open for opportunity. So you'll get that call on a wet Tuesday morning. Um, again, there's a great luxury to having that. But, uh, yeah, don't be afraid to let people know that you're uh, available for things and say yes to things. That's great advice. And I would just have a segue, Phelps, could you, could you see this guy has something? Could, was, it, was it just... Obviously the physique, oh, but just the energy. I didn't understand, but obviously, you know, Paddy was in that game. I, I didn't know anything about sports uh, marketing at the time, but uh, he said, this is a once in a lifetime. Like this guy is beyond spits, beyond, you know, he's wider than he is tall and he was blowing everybody out of the water. He was with his college coach, Bob, and uh, it was, they, he knew. I mean, I think Paddy uh, went off and, and kind of took him personally and made his own name on it. Uh, afterwards but uh yeah and i mean what did he end up in did he end up beating spitz's record in athens the next year in terms of goals I think eight, he probably eight, did. Was it eight goals was it eight from memory Maybe yeah something like that all i remember is he used to eat like you know 20 chickens and 40 eggs and whatever i've been trying to do the same myself but i haven't been swimming 10k a day so uh there's a bit of a misjoint that is it that, that's fascinating um funny stories over the years do you want to share with us like obviously there's four and maybe mistakes out of the funny stories you know kind of stuff oh, can go, can I'm go good wrong at those. i'm good at those i actually thanks to deck ryan i used to do this thing called flounders for failed founders which was just a piss up because uh, we weren't allowed to get into the web summit founders thing and so everyone had to bring their failure story you know for the year now most of it is self-deprecating you know i'm actually fine but this is how i messed up but you just want to find good ways for people to admit that they messed up my own mess up story, we, that, what, sorry, what came from that was Startup Wakes, where we would bury dead startups because 90% of them don't work. And we were dressed as priests and all sorts of things and brought around the world, which is great fun. But again, it's finding a safe place where people will actually admit what went wrong. My first big mistake was soon after I joined at Havoc, uh, they wanted me to go to San Jose and build a big uh, presence at a trade show. And I remember we'd raised 2 million punts that's how long ago it was. Uh, and I had never, I'd never been to California before. I'd never really done anything like that, but you know, I was going to give it a good go. And so I built a stand at this trade show, which most people will be familiar with. They've all been to these trade shows. Every sector has them. And I put it between the Microsoft and the Sony stand 
uh, because Microsoft were just launching their Xbox. And I thought that would be where there was loads of traffic. And I didn't understand things like union drage rules and that plasma screens, which predated LCD screens, were you know as much to buy as they were to hire. Anyway, I think I spent half a million punts on this stand. And it looked like a shantytown in between the Microsoft and the Sony stand. And people were just kind of embarrassed and went, oh, my God, I think that's some Irish company. We couldn't even go to it. So they should have fired me. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure they were about to fire me. And uh, it didn't work at all. And so they gave me, I think, 2,000 punts for the next trade show. And we could do anything except hired an old RV, as the Americans called them, and parked them in the car park. We couldn't even afford tickets to the next trade show. Then, then I, I had the great breakthrough of my life, which is people hate trade shows. They hate going to them. They hate traipsing around the stands. They hate everything about it. They just love getting together as an industry. So they heard that there were these guys out in the car park with beer and laptops in an RV. And we sold more business out the back of that RV than we had in uh, years beforehand. And so I realized I was onto something. So I spent 10 years hiring stupider and stupider vehicles to go and do trade shows without ever actually darkening the door of the event itself and realizing that that's all people wanted. So we hired, you know, uh, double-decker London buses in L.A. and drove them around downtown L.A. Uh, we hired uh, trolley cars in San Francisco, uh, amphibious vehicles in San Diego, hot air balloons in Napa, I think, was when I jumped the shark completely. But what I realized was you could, not only you could spend the day having your meetings on these silly vehicles with a beer and everyone thought it was hilarious, you could pick them up after the show and bring them to the trade parties because you couldn't afford the parties either. Uh, and you were the meta party. You were the party that got you to the other parties. And actually, even though we worked quite hard behind the scenes at it, we had a couple of hundred million exits. On, and I like to think, of course, I would being the marketing PR guy, that uh, a big part of it was the parties that were being thrown on these city vehicles that were uh, driving around the uh, nondescript events convention centers in all these huge cities. So to this day, I know exactly how to get out of parking tickets in most U.S. metropolitan cities. And uh, it was great fun. We hired, a, I think we hired a couple of yachts in Lisbon and in Cannes as well. And, you know, we do the European version of it as well. And uh, it really, really worked. You got the customers. People only ever remember the first drink and the last drink anyway, you know. So as long as you're putting both those in their hand, they'll sign anything. And no pressure and more human and more relaxed. And they didn't have to perform all these things. They weren't on. So they could be exactly themselves. And except exactly. That, and being Irish, of course, you know, we, we have this ability to, you know. Yeah. It maneuver, was almost accepted. Maneuver yeah. around. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, actually, that's a, a really good example onto networking. So what do you understand about networking? Because, in effect, you've just explained how you kind of network on one level, on one, one area. Do you want to talk for, for that 22 or 23-year-old who's come out of college, where do I go? There's no jobs. The world's shut down. H how would they network? Yeah, e either educate or entertain. You know, that's what you've got. You've got, no matter what you have, you've got some life experience that tells you, okay, I know something about this market, this sector, this, uh, this product, this company that nobody else does. So I'm going to educate people on that very specific thing, or uh, I'm going to entertain them with tangential uh, ways to, to, to get them there. And that's what networking is. Let, leave them feeling more fulfilled than when they met you first. And it doesn't have to be, you know, play to your strengths. If you're entertaining, which I like to think I am, that's pretty much what I did. Uh, you know, but if you've got huge insights into something and it's very, very specific, you know, you, your youth is your advantage. It's also your disadvantage because you don't have experience. But as that young startup, you know, you are probably the market they're trying to go after. So you can explain to the middle aged execs exactly how you would go after it, what the new thing is. So it's about leaning into that, I guess. Sorry to use an awful phrase. But I think to a great extent, you know, what are companies? Companies are, you know, their, their talent and ability within it. They're some market domain expertise that they think they know a better way of doing something or that they can get to a better way of doing it. Uh, and then it's timing. And timing, you kind of bend to your will. Timing, I think, is a catch-all thing where it's not actually timing. You're just trying to create sectoral hotness at this particular time. You know, there was Airbnb, there, were, there was plenty of search and, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer accommodation before Airbnb. There was plenty of search before Google. It was just, could they do it at 15% better at a time when there was a consumer tipping point coming anyway, and they happened to be right there in the dam where it was needed. So I think the one bit of advice I always give to young, sorry, I know I'm a bit all over the place here, but 
the one bit of advice I go is try a startup. There's no cost to startups anymore. I mean, there are costs to scale ups and where you want to get to and everything else, but basically all the things that used to cost us offices and, you know, photocopiers and everything that we started out with is, is they're all zero cost things now. And the, the number one thing in our world, in the technology world that people want to look for is initiative and learning and your failure where they were, you know, you're looking for a job now rather than what you were doing. But the most marketable you'll ever be is just at the end of your startup if you have enough self-awareness to know why it didn't work because they're the kinds of initiative-led people that people actually want uh, to get that first job you know if you've had 12 failures there might be an issue and we might end up to uh, stage an intervention uh, but to to really start out that that's kind of what we hire for it's okay we all know you'd rather be running your own thing but it didn't work out but as long as you know why and you've still got that kind of energy and drive and initiative i think you're great to add to because what we can only rent their brains now for the two or three years when we hope they're at their most productive and their most proper fit with your organization um and so i think you know previous uh, you're, you're hiring almost like for velocity rather than ability at that age i think so and, and when you're hiring for your own company I, I know we talked a year ago and i see you've expanded uh, i just had a quick look at the website you've hired quite a number what are you kind of looking for i mean i know you've mentioned some of the probably the in the previous statement some of the kind of characteristics but for your particular business yeah you're, you're looking for someone that can internalize complexity very quickly and then regurgitate it in a in a simplistic form not because in pr journalists are simplistic in fact they're some of the most sophisticated and broadly educated people i know the, the funny thing I always like to tease Irish journalists about is, you know, the number one profession that journalists go into on the West Coast in California is VC, because journalism and venture capital is essentially the same uh, set of skills, just without the money. Uh, you know, they're trying to separate the wheat from the chaff. They're trying to see, you know, is this idea, uh, has its time come? How close to market fit are they? Have they the right team in place? Have they the right other, you know, um, the, the, the other variables that are needed to make a successful company. And it's the same for journalists. They write for their editors. They write because they need to back more winners than losers because they don't just want to keep writing one-off stories about companies that don't go anywhere. They want to follow the trajectory of that company. And so that they can go to their editor going, I saw something in those guys way back when, and I've followed them. And they also like to be able to write the trajectory story and what the new news is and where it gets to. So in many ways, they're trying to, uh, you know, pick trend stories that are, are going to be broadly uh, uh, affirming for their uh, readers. And to an extent, that's how I, I hire. Can someone, can someone outline where the ball is going to hop in 18 months' time and why? Now, the ball rarely hops where you think it's going to hop exactly because nobody is that much of a soothsayer. But uh, if you can broadly go, look, we think the whole market is going this way and this is where it's going to hop and here's the three or four top reasons why we think that's going to happen – then you can pitch a journalist who can pitch their editor and eventually it gets in somewhere and then hopefully it helps your company to fulfill that prophecy, if you will. So that sounds very... Yeah. Uh, and would you think, you know, about there's no such thing as a stupid question or a stupid idea on one level. Uh, yeah. That breadth of, okay, let's have a go at this and let's try and visualize where it might or might not go. And there's no control, as you know, and things change as they get there. Is that, is that kind of a trait... You look for it is. I mean, there's an appropriateness to what safe space you want to be in when you do that. If you've yeah. got a good relationship with the clients and I wouldn't start it on day one with, uh, you know, all of the stupid questions you're trying to get there. And in a way, there's, an always, there's always a tension in our business because people who are good at doing their own PR go, well, why should we pay you to do it? And mostly that's because you need someone to traffic copy it. So it's figuring out what that client needs at that time because it just gets too complex when you're doing multiple product SKUs in multiple territories with multiple different journalists, eventually you're just going to piss those journalists off because something you promised them in one place, you haven't been able to come up with other angles on that story to get it somewhere else. And then there are some clients that just need you to do it completely. It's not in their skill set. They might be a genius on some other level. In fact, working in tech, most of them are. Um, but they, they just haven't quite figured out, well, why, why do I have to play this game? And in some instances, you don't. You can go the anti-tech route. You know, you can go the anti-PR friendly route, but you just have to own it completely uh, and really double down on it. And people will, you know, they'll just go on your growth. But for a lot of companies, they need that escape velocity. You know, you're in something like fintech or, you know, administration or data protection or whatever. There's just so much noise out there. Tell me why, what is the sale that you put in front of yourself 
that uh, differentiates you and pulls you along into different stories. Like ultimately, you don't want to be the story. You want to be in the third paragraph explaining what's happening in the sector. That's what real industry leaders do. And that's the point. That's the KPI you want to get to, where it's an interesting story and you're a hugely uh, important component and driving part of that. And in a space where like the fintech, you'll have a number of, I'm just thinking of Revolut, but you have a number of, yeah. of products, is that the right word, or services, doing kind of the same thing. So it must be a short time if, if you have a particular, could you want to share any stories of the ones that just got it yeah. right and jumped very quickly? I'm just curious that, you know, and the, maybe one, maybe the one, maybe you can't say the ones who didn't, that might be a, a, a inappropriate, but, or why they didn't, maybe they mention their name. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd go back, in fact, one of our clients, N26, is a challenger bank um, out of Germany, much like Revolut. In fact, Revolut's kind of an outlier in Ireland because it has a million customers or so, you know, um, so it's been reported and N26 wouldn't, whereas in France, Germany or whatever, N26 would be much bigger. Now, they're regulated as a bank, full bank, and, you know, it's out of the German financial services and all that kind of thing. But they're fascinated by, you know, why are they being taken up here and not elsewhere? And how do you get there? And are you competing with other challenger banks or are you just competing with incumbent banks? And you can see the move that's been made here recently with the four banks coming together on a payment service. I wouldn't be hugely hopeful for it. I mean, it's good that they're doing it. Um, but it's interesting to see what the dynamic is and then who is left with the actual customers they want, the paying customers, the people that actually will, you know, sustain the company long term versus they were just going for the, the, the green field and they were getting any customer they could as quick as they could. But the, the thing I'm reminded of was one of my first customers was Currency Fair, which was a peer-to-peer uh, currency matching, uh, founded by Brett Myers, uh, an Australian. He was a good friend of mine to this day. And his number one problem was he was so cheap that nobody believed it was true. And so they were matching currency people going the other way. Uh, it's old hat now, the whole peer-to-peer uh, marketplace. But back then it was kind of new. And on average, they were charging 03 to 0.5% for a currency conversion for a rent or a mortgage or your paycheck or, you know, whatever you want. Uh, but at the time, the banks were somewhere between 3 and 5%. And we just couldn't get it through. People would not trust them because they were 10 times cheaper. They just couldn't believe the banks were ripping them off to that extent for so long that they were like lobsters boiled in a pot. And so eventually we had to just get, you know, we would, I remember Enda Kenny came to open the office and we had that all over it. Then you get the RTE and the Business Post, but then you get the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal and CNBC. And again, they had a big competitor at the time, TransferWise. And our job was to make sure that they were just side by side with TransferWise everywhere they went because they were spending 10x the money with Andreessen Horowitz backing and everything else. But anyway, my, my point was, from a PR point of view, it was a real challenge because people just didn't, they could not believe that something could be this good. There had to be a catch. Now, we eventually got there, but actually it was retail PR. You know, it was... It was the French people living in London that were taxed out of it by, uh, uh, who was the guy before Macron? The other fella. And uh, the socialist guy. Sir, and, Sir Cozy, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. And they yeah. were, no, no, he was right wing. It was another fella, bald headed fella who was uh, the prime minister. Anyway, um, I think personal tax rates had gone up to 75, 80%. So they were all living in London, all the, the, the fintech execs, but they had to send home their money to do it. So we, we started sponsoring uh, church, uh, French school uh, open days in London. So it was real, you know, GA teams in Australia. So that when people were sending back their two or three grants, they could do it 10 times cheaper. Um, but anyway, sorry, it was just interesting in terms of, it, it gave me a great grounding in what actually works in fintech, which is value and trust. And when you don't have the bricks and mortar, even though there are millstone around the bank's necks now, they do give people a sense of, well, at least I can go in there and get my money back. So you have to work 10 times harder PR-wise. PR is kind of your bricks and mortar trust when it comes to fintech. Uh, they really need endorsement. They need other people to have used it before. They need other people to say, that's what I want to go with. They're the guys that I trust. And this is where we want to get to. So it's been interesting building that up with, with different fintechs over the years. Interesting. Mentoring. Have you had mentors over the years or people who accidentally I, are, are, yeah. are, are... Yeah, I have. And I, and I really appreciate it. We have an advisory, um, advisory board, which is basically we do once a quarter, uh, we do a lunch. Uh, and they're all very different. And a lot of them would come from the investment community, venture capital, um, some journalists that I trust, because I, I started out in this 25 years ago with journalists, and now I'm there with kind of journalists that own their their own entities, you know, and and that are either editor or 
or owner level. And so it's interesting to see what the next trends are and what their own business is. Some of our clients, Kinzen, Mark Little, he would have gone through Storyful. They are the business of journalism itself and, and the infodemic that's out there. Um, so I always try and mentor back. I really enjoy working with the accelerator programs, the NDRCs, Dog Patches. Well, they're the same thing now. Um, Enterprise Ireland. And it's great to be able to give people advice or shortcuts. Uh, now, they, they shouldn't always take it because everyone plows their own story in the end. But uh, at least you can tell them where certain things went wrong. That's that's more uh, um, helpful, I think, to most of them than others. I don't, and I probably need one. I don't have a PR mentor, you know, in terms of I'm arrogant enough to think I know how to do this and get there. So that's next on my list. I need someone who's been through this and, uh, you know, grown a much bigger business. But then we're not a big business. You know, we're 10, 12 people. I'm kind of happy with that. It's three teams doing Ireland, Europe, and the world. And we could be doing it from anywhere. We just, this is where we want to live and this is where we want to be. Um, and so I've almost kept it small and tight on purpose. But, you know, we, we worked with Intercom from the, the start, uh, uh, not anymore now, but, uh, you know, from year two to five, shall we say, and they became Ireland's first indigenous uh, unicorn. Um, it's been fascinating to be able to help companies at certain stages through those stages. I like to think of us that we're the scalers. We're not very good for you if you're actually well established and off you go. Uh, it's more if you've got that dynamic of, you know, that that sharp, short shock of we need to get to here, from here, we know how to help you get there. And in the end, not to demystify it or anything, but it's traffic copying. You know, it's, it's at a very good level knowing what stories are going to be written about, what journalists are doing it, and is there a match there for you? And knowing that they're not going to give you advertising. You have to either educate or entertain or give some other insight to to be worth putting into the story uh, because, uh, you know, there's no free lunch. Exactly. Two, two, two final questions. Um, you can take them together if you want. Uh, one around the workplace stress. Uh, I know you're a cyclist and um, you enjoy that, that kind of mindfulness, you know, on the whole time. It's a kind of a 24-hour coach now mm-hmm. and you work in different time zones. And then the last question would be five words to describe your career. So maybe that first one of, have you thoughts around that? And it's all changed over 25 years. I mean, it's, everybody's on now. I mean, whether we like it or not, and that's not a good, it can be a good and a bad thing. That's <clears> a, yeah, I don't know. And, and it's, it's been even tougher with the pandemic. We, we went virtual in March and gave up the office in June. I think the lease was up anyway. And I don't know that we're ever going back. I mean, the juniors need it, but um, I think we can do that in various other places and in various other ways. Certainly presenteeism is dead. It's more now prove to me we need to do this in the office rather than prove to me you can work from home. Um, certain people have made it because they they know how to work this you know the system at home and how it'll work and where you'll get to. But you you um, it, it's been stressful in ways I don't think we'll understand until later. I think ultimately it depends on your life stage. It's been good if you are where you want to be, if you're living where you want to be and you're comfortable. And you're with your family and this it's still tough, but that's easier. If you're young and you're starting out and you're in a box room flat somewhere, it's very hard to be on nine to five really strong and and still have everything else you need. And then if you're older and you don't have necessarily, you know, the supports around you because people can't come to visit as much anymore, that's also very hard. So for me, getting out and meeting people, cycling, walking, swimming, whatever way you can do it has become almost uh, uh, mandatory because I can see my mental health going down and I can see the, you know, the Glen Row music coming on on a Sunday night if I haven't tired myself out. Because the, the normal stuff that, you know, we used to do a lot of faffing during the days, the normal stuff of getting to meetings, getting to the office, getting back, at least there was a bit of exercise to it. There was a small bit of stress to it as well. So the good news is that's gone. You know, the two or three hours a day of just getting around is gone. But at the same time, you probably need a bit, a half hour intense exercise or an hour just to counteract that physically as well as mentally and getting out. So I'm trying to carve out that time and make sure that everybody else has that time as well. But God forgive me, it doesn't work over Zoom. Zoom is work. Uh, you know, yeah, I just I just feel as much as you can, you know, get it, get into a good pair of uh, long johns and go drinking outside and meet as many people as you can outside and distanced and everything else. That'll get us through this. And in terms of the five words, I always, con- I always consider myself not an entrepreneur, an accidental entrepreneur. Um, 
because I think the true entrepreneurs are the ones that create something from nothing. I think you and I are, we're in a service business. We're entrepreneurial, but uh, the phrase someone said to me once, and I loved it, was you're entrepreneurially adjacent. I love being the, the, <laughs> That's the, a good, the yeah, I get that. Yeah, I, yeah. Can, I can help an entrepreneur be better, but I don't, I don't have that true entrepreneurial spirit of I, there's no guide rails. I don't know where I'm going. Come on, we can win. You know, that frightens the BGAs out of me. I need guide rails. I'm in a service consultancy business because, okay, it's never going to set the world on fire. Some of our work has, and some of our clients do. But I, I, think, and I'm, I think I'm like most people in that. You know, I, I do believe there is an entrepreneurial spark that is, and, and it can be anyone, and it can be from any social class, and it can be from any, you know, perspective. But they just have a tolerance of risk that the rest of us aren't, re- aren't prepared to put up with. You know, we want our security. We're willing to give over that risk and reward thing for some sense of security. So I think entrepreneurially adjacent is what's made me very happy in life, actually, because you get to live a bit vicariously through them. You get a little bit of thrill. Okay, you mightn't have that whole sense of accomplishment yourself, but uh, you get to weave yourself in and out of other people's tapestries and really help them uh, to an extent. So you don't have full ownership. But you, you, you get to enjoy it and you get to enjoy their wins. And hopefully you don't take their losses uh, too, too hard anyway on the chin. That's, that's great. Paul, I want to thank you so much for taking time today to, to talk to us. I'm sure people listening to uh, your, your words, particularly on taking the year out, I think that's going to maybe, a, you, might, you might start a, 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 a people moving of them all around going but uh, listen I want to thank you for your time as usual for, for sharing everything a pleasure a real pleasure thank you thank you for listening to the Career Scoop brought to you by Elevate Career Advice and Elevate Executive Selection Dublin and Bermuda I'm James Fitzsimons and I hope you've enjoyed listening hope you tune in next week for more episodes bye bye